If you have a Bible, um, it would be helpful perhaps to have it open at 2 Corinthians and chapter 2. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2 and verses 14 uh, to 17. People spend a lot of money on smelling good, don't they? You know this. Um, whichever kind of shops you go in, there's always products to help you smell good. And we can be taken in by them quite easily. I certainly was as a teenager. As a teenager, there were many adverts on the telly for Lynx. Do you remember Lynx? Yes, yeah, sadly I do. And I was taken in and I bought Lynx as a sweaty, spotty teenager. <laughs> I actually thought it would be a good antiperspirant. Take note. Antiperspirant. Um, but I remember declaring to a group of friends one time, I've tried it, it doesn't work. To which they laughed hilariously because they thought it was meant to do something else. I didn't do that either. It didn't attract anybody. But people will spend a lot of money on fragrances. Uh, but who do you want to please with your smell? Nobody wants to smell bad, do they? Nobody wants to repel people by their smell. That's why fragrances sell so well. But who do you want to please with your smell? Because your smell of something, I don't just necessarily mean literally, as I'm sure you're aware, but you will give off an aroma. We're looking at verses 14 uh, to 17 of 2 Corinthians 2 this morning. We'll split it in three. I'll I'll try to be relatively brief because we have got communion uh, at the end of the service as well today. Uh, But first of all, just verse 14. Verse 14, captured by Christ. And we haven't got to the smell bit yet, but we need to start here first in verse 14. Captured by Christ. Let me uh, read that letter again. That letter? No, just that verse. Uh, Verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession. What well, comes to your mind's eye when you hear that phrase, triumphal procession? And we thought about this in Home Group a couple of weeks back, and there were various answers. Uh, some people immediately think of royal pageantry. Uh, so uh, a bit like when there's a great uh, state occasion to do with the royal family, whether it's a coronation or something like that. And you have people dressed up in all their fine regalia on horseback and in horse-drawn carriages and everything looking incredibly beautiful and impressive. This great triumphal procession of the king or queen. Others' minds immediately went somewhere else. They went to open bus top parades through a town or city when their football team wins the FA Cup or the Premier League. And that's what they think of the triumphal procession. And the footballers shaking the champagne bottles on the top and firing them off into the crowd as they're watching. That's the triumphal uh, procession. Uh, But is that what Paul expects his readers to have in mind uh, when he says what he says at the start of verse 14? Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession. Uh, I mean, things like I've just described did happen. You would have coronations of leaders, I'm sure, with great pageantry. Um, his, his readers were, were in a Greek city and they were familiar with things like the Olympics, the ancient Olympics, where the, the victors would be uh, cheered to the rafters for their victories. But it, that's not really what this verse refers to. That's not the picture that he's wanting to create in people's minds as he says this. The picture is, is much more this. It's of, say for example, a Roman general who goes out from Rome to the outer edges of the empire, to the rebellious fringes that need to be conquered and suppressed. And he goes out with his legions and he defeats the enemy. And having defeated the enemy, he takes them captive. Many of them, of course, would have been slaves of the people who had been conquered. Slavery was common throughout the world then. And they take the slaves and they make them their own and they bring them back to Rome in triumphant procession as they go through the streets of Rome with all the people they have captured behind them. That's the picture. Which we might actually think, well, I'd prefer it was one of the other ones, actually. (laughs) That sounds a bit brutal. 
Well, it, in reality, it often was <laughs> when the Romans did it or any other state power, if you like. But it is the picture that we're to have in mind in some sense. The picture of Christ having triumphed. He's triumphed. But it's a, a triumph of loving, obedient self-sacrifice. Christ triumphs through his loving, love of God and people, obedient, obedient to his Father, self-sacrifice, giving himself. <coughs> Uh, there's a, a couple of places in the New Testament that I'm going to turn to. You can turn there if you want, that help us to, to understand this a little more and what's going on. Uh, the first is in another of Paul's letters, just a few pages on in the New Testament. Colossians, his letter to the Colossians, uh, and chapter 2. In chapter 2, um, Paul talks about how uh, Christ has uh, rescued us, how he has uh, brought us from death uh, to life. And in verses uh, 14 uh, and 15, uh, this is how he speaks. He speaks to the Colossian Christians to remind them uh, of what Christ has done. Verse 14, Christ erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us. So he's, he's erased this certificate of debt. What is it? It's got obligations, it's against us, it's opposed to us. It's basically like, if you like a charge sheet against us in God's court. So God as judge, we are brought before him. Uh, the record of crimes, sins, is there on a charge sheet before God. And it's against us. We've done these things and we deserve to be punished. But Christ has erased that charge sheet. It's as if all those sins we've committed, and they're many, too many to number, have just been rubbed out. There is no charge against us anymore. Why? Well, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. In other words, that charge sheet is attached to him and he is nailed to the cross. It's nailed to the cross with him. Our sins, nailed to the cross with Jesus. But in doing that, how does Paul describe what he's done at the cross? In verse 15, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them uh, in the translation you may have got in front of you, will either say in him or in the cross. The Greek word is ambiguous. We can't know for certain which one it means. It could mean either one. But the point is, Christ triumphs through his death on the cross. He triumphs over these rulers, authorities. Who are they? The devil and his angels, basically. It doesn't mean the Roman authorities. It doesn't mean the Jewish authorities who put him on the cross. It means... The spiritual forces who are arrayed against God and his people. Christ defeats them, disgraces them publicly at the cross as he deals with our sin. He does that in obedience to his Father. It's the Father's plan and his plan too, but he does it in obedience to the Father. He does it because he loves us. And it's amazing love, isn't it? take somebody's charge sheet and say I'll take that that can fall on me and in doing it he releases us from the kingdom of darkness where we were enslaved and brings us into the kingdom of light God's kingdom through self-sacrifice so that's Christ's triumph this triumphal nature of what is described in verse 14 of our reading his triumph is at the cross it's a triumph over sin, the death and the, sin, death and the devil he triumphs over them all on our behalf through his obedient, loving self-sacrifice. But then there's the procession bit. What's that? Well, that does get referred to elsewhere in Paul's letters too. Ephesians. It's only a very passing reference, but it is there. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 
8. He's in the middle of talking about something else, really, Paul, but he, he uses, he quotes a psalm to describe what Christ has done in his death and, and then resurrection. So verse 8 says, For it says, he's referring to the Old Testament, When he, that's Christ, ascended on high, he took the captives captive. Um, that was in our song we just sang, wasn't it? Leading captives in his wake. He took the captives captive. The procession that, that follows behind him is people who were captive to, to sin and death and the devil. That was all of us. He has taken those captives captive to himself. They're now his. They're no longer in captivity to sin and death and the devil. They are his captives. They're his people. They follow him. They proceed, if you like that procession, behind him. We have been captured by Christ through his death and resurrection. That's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, Christ, often our world thinks of freedom as in freedom to just be my own and nobody else's. The Bible never uses that category. The Bible has two categories. We either belong to the devil and that's slavery. Or we're Christ's slaves and that's true freedom. Those are the only two categories. There isn't, I belong to myself and therefore I'm free. No, we belong to the prince of the power of the air, that's Ephesians 2. Or we belong to Christ. We're his. We're part of his triumphal procession. So that's, that's why it's a bit like this Roman general going off, conquering, taking captive people who were slaves to another people. They're now his slaves and he brings them back to Rome in triumph. You might not want to be the slave of a Roman general. You do want to be the slave of Christ. You do want to be his servant. You do want to be his. That's not the only way we're described as being, belonging to Christ. We're also his brothers and sisters. We're also God's children. Slave isn't the only category used, but it's one. We belong to him. We're his. And that is a, a good thing. There's nothing better. It's much better than thinking we belong to ourselves. That way is disastrous. But the way in which Christ does this, the, this first point's the longest, by the way. The way in which Christ does this, it, it gives off an aroma to God. It's strange language, isn't it? You probably found it a bit strange, and the kids definitely did, as we did the kids today. Why use the language of God smelling something? Uh, Paul is actually drawing on language from the Old Testament sacrificial system. About the only other places you'll, you'll read this word aroma in the Bible, in the books of Exodus and Leviticus, and then a bit in Ezekiel. And it's referring to the sacrificial system where God's people had to bring sacrifices to him that pleased him. Burnt offerings was one of them. And the aroma, it said that the aroma that went up from the burnt offering was pleasing to God. It pleased him. The aroma of a, a sacrifice. Often they were sacrifices of atonement. In other words, they were sacrifices that, that taught the people that you've sinned and a price has to be paid. A sacrifice has to be made to pay for that sin. And when a sacrifice is made, that means the Lord is pleased again because of the smell of that sacrifice. Now those sacrifices couldn't actually deal with sin at all. They pointed forward to something else, a sacrifice that would deal with sin, would make atonement for sin. Atonement, by the way, is a made-up word by a guy called William Tyndale who wanted to translate what this sacrifice meant. So he took, he took at one meant and turned it into a word. We're made up one with God again. Atonement, at one meant, with God. It has to come through sacrifice. Christ sacrificing himself for us out of obedience to his Father, love for us. That is a pleasing aroma to God. The pleasing aroma to God. That's what makes God happy. And that's where the language of aroma comes from, the burnt offering of the Old Testament. Christ fulfills it at the cross. But actually, as we read on, we'll see that we're to smell like that too. We're to smell like that. To praise God that in Christ, Christ has, has given himself for us in that way. And that's, we, we love him, I hope. 
We will love him if he's done that for us and we've trusted him to do that for us. But if we're then captivated by Christ's love, we want to give off that aroma as well, don't we? If that's what truly captivates you and I, the love of Christ, well, we want to smell like that too. What will that look like? It will look like loving, obedient self-sacrifice. Which really fits with the theme of 2 Corinthians. Paul has spoken of what he's been through for the sake of the Corinthians, for the sake of others, in obedience to God. And it has been self-sacrifice. Following Christ in his procession. But he knows that it's a pleasing aroma to God. It pleases him and that's what we want. Let's go to verses, for the second half of verse 14 and then verses 15 and 16. Let me read those again. Through us, God spreads the aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are aroma of death leading to death. But to others, an aroma of life leading to life. Who is adequate for these things? What we see in these verses is this smell of Christ the fragrance of Christ, loving obedience to God that is self-sacrificial, it splits opinion. It splits opinion. It always pleases God. It doesn't please all the people. It doesn't please all the people. It's strong words, aren't they? Uh, there in, in verse 16, to some we're an aroma of death leading to death. But to others, an aroma of life leading to life. As a Christian, it's not that we're doing something wrong if people disapprove of our life, if that's a life of obedience to God, of love for others, of self-sacrifice. Some people will not like it. Some people will be drawn to it. Praise God. To go back to the food illustrations of earlier, it's a bit like Marmite. Okay? You love it or you hate it. Uh, this is an example of this going on in our news at the moment, I think. Pretty clear example. Um, some of you might have followed the story, others of you, it will be news to you. Uh, but in Scotland, you may have realised there's a, a, a race for the leadership of the Scottish National Party, the SNP. A couple of weeks ago, Nicola Sturgeon, rather surprisingly to everybody, would seem stepped down, she resigned, and then there was the race on to replace her. There are three main candidates, it would appear. Um, one of them, I won't make any comments on the other two, uh, but one of them is a professing evangelical Christian. Her name is Kate Forbes. Uh, she's only young, she's in her early 30s, she was actually on maternity leave when Nicola Sturgeon resigned. So some wondered whether she'd stand, but she decided to. Now, I'm not really making any comment here on the politics of Scottish independence, that's not my interest at this point. Um, at all. But it's been fascinating to see the reaction of members of the Scottish National Party, uh, the Scottish public, the media, to Kate Forbes, because she does not hide her Christianity. It is not a private thing. It's not something that she demurs on when she's asked about it. She's very clear. Um, most of the questions have been around the area of sexual ethics. Uh, does she believe that people should be able to self-ID whatever gender they think they are? That's been a big issue in Scottish politics, and that's a big issue in politics all sort, but especially in Scottish politics in the last few months. And she was asked, um, is a transgender woman a woman? Uh, now, most politicians would prevaricate on that answer, or they would give an answer that, frankly, isn't true. She was very clear. She simply said, I believe a, a trans woman is a biological male who identifies as a woman. Now, that doesn't sound controversial to many of us, but it went down like a lead balloon <laughs> with many. She was asked about whether she thought it was right for people to have children outside of wedlock, and she answered, no, I don't believe it is right. 
She was also, for what it's worth, clear that she didn't think that every Christian belief should be put on their law, law books. Now, you can agree or disagree with that, but she said that as well. But her own personal beliefs were Christian. She was also very clear that Christ is her Lord and Saviour. She follows him first and foremost. She will be a Christian for all eternity, long after she stops being a politician. Politics will end, she said. The kingdom of God will not. That is what I belong to. I slightly paraphrase, but that was very clearly her meaning. She loves the Lord Jesus. She said, she said basically, the gospel is her priority, but she serves as a politician. That's what she does. So she's been a breath of fresh air to some, praise God. To others, she absolutely stinks. Absolutely stinks. And the amount of flack she's faced, I think we should all pray for her. Whether we agree with her politics or not is another matter. You may or may not. But as a Christian making a stand for the gospel, but also obedience to God for the Christian, I think we should pray for her. It's a very public witness that she's found herself giving. And she's not shirked from it. She's not backed off. But you can very much see this. It's the aroma of life to some, an honest intent. Politician of integrity who won't lie, but it's the aroma of death to others. Someone who does not affirm all my beliefs about what I can do with my body. Now, we probably won't ever face the spotlight in the way Kate Forbes does. <laughs> it's unlikely that you or I will end up on the national news nights in a row. Because we take a stand for the gospel and for obedience to God in our lives. For saying that, okay, you don't necessarily have to be responsible or answerable to the government for this, but we're all answerable to God for it. Which is basically what she says. But I think we're naive if we don't think it will happen in our own lives, in our workplace, in our families, in our neighbourhoods, in our interactions with friends and so on. If we're going to stay faithful to God, love people self-sacrificially, because there's got to be that too. It's not all about being belligerently, I got the truth. <laughs> it's also loving self-sacrifice. But even when the loving self-sacrifice is there, along with the truth of God's word, it will be death to some people. Don't be put off by that, Paul is saying here. Don't be put off by that. That. We should expect that. In fact, Tim Farron, local MP in Kendall, he was interviewed about all this. Because he, he did prevaricate when he was in a similar situation as leader of the um, Liberal Democrats. But he, he, he said, I got it wrong. She was more ready than I was. But he said, at the end of the day, he said, I believe what I believe and I'm going to state it. And to be honest, he said, I'm not bothered if people don't like it because Jesus told me some people won't. Some people will, others will hate it. I'm okay with that, he's in charge. I thought that was really good. That's a great witness. And it's true. We shouldn't be surprised because the way the world defines love, which is what a lot of this is about, isn't it? Is not always God's definition of love. We need to show God's love according to God's word. And we need to do it self-sacrificially in order to be like Christ. But the great news is, while some will hate that, Paul does not leave it at that, does he? He says, but remember to others, that will be the aroma of life leading to life. Don't be afraid to be all in for Jesus, in other words, and be like him. Because yes, some will hate it, but some will smell something on the breeze I think oh I'm drawn to that what's that I want to know where that smell's coming from I want to know more about it that, that, that smells good that smells like life let's pray that our lives would give off the fragrance of Christ and some will be drawn many will be drawn to it uh, last of all verse 17 Sincere servants, not salesmen. Sincere servants, not salesmen. Paul says in verse 17, 
For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. It's interesting he uses the word market there uh, and marketing. What does marketing do? Typical adverts on the telly or that pop up on your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed. What are they doing? Uh, they're trying to make everything appeal, everything they, that you see appeal to you in every way. They're not going to tell you any of the disadvantages of their product or anything you might not like about it. They're just going to give you the selling points, aren't they? Um, what do they say about um, houses? When you try to sell your house, have some bread baking in the background. So they'll, they'll come in and think, oh, I want this house. It smells of baking bread. It might be masking, of course, the smell of mould in one of the bedrooms. But there we are. You're not going to tell them that. At least that's the idea if you're marketing it well. You, you show the, the good points. The points that will appeal to your market, to the buyer. We have to remember our eye as believers, though, is not primarily on the people watching us. Although it is as well, to an extent, but the person we're actually aiming to please, first and foremost, and not displeased by anything we do, is who? Who is this aroma ultimately? For We speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. All that we do is to be from God, his word, his love, his self-sacrifice in Christ. And it's before him he sees it all. It's ultimately before him that we're living. That is vital, isn't it? We're not call to kind of compromise God's word and kind of smooth off the edges as we see them or as the world might see them the edges, the sharp bits, the pointy bits in order to be more appealing to the world uh, nor are we to make the gospel unnecessarily, unnecessarily unattractive either <laughs> that's not the point here There are ways of contextualising according to your culture and the people you're seeking to reach, absolutely. And they don't displease God. But we don't compromise God's truth. We don't compromise the gospel. We don't compromise God's word. It's before God that we're ultimately accountable. He won't be pleased if we've apparently got people to come to church and to Christ. It's doubtful whether they have when we've compromised the gospel. That doesn't please God, but we're doing this to please God. We're to be sincere servants of God, not second-hand car salesmen <laughs> to people covering up the dodgy gearbox. Not at all. So let's seek to remember do with sincerity before God. Now, I hope you're not all feeling thoroughly discouraged at this stage because it's a high calling, isn't it? Smell like Jesus. Be the fragrance of Christ before God and to those around. And some of them are going to hate it, although thankfully some of them will see life and come to him. I find that almost overwhelmingly difficult. How can I be like Jesus? Well, Paul asked the same question, actually. I skipped it, but it's at the end of verse 16. If you're feeling that way, Paul gets it. Who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate for these things? Honestly, who's up to this? Uh, sometimes our chapter divisions <laughs> can be frustrating in our Bibles. They weren't there when Paul wrote them. Paul didn't put chapter and verse divisions in. Because Paul actually answers the question just a few verses later. Who is adequate for these things? Skip down to chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. There's that before God language again. And we can be confident through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent, able, capable in ourselves to claim anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy, who is adequate for these things, our adequacy is from God. Isn't that good news? If you feel a bit overwhelmed by trying to do this and you think you can't, well, you're right. <laughs> you can't. I can't either. 
But our adequacy as God's people is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter. So it's, these aren't just words on a page that we've, we've somehow got to make ourselves obey and, and fulfill and carry out. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Of course, the great gift of the new covenant, as described there, is the spirit in every believer, isn't it? It's God in us. Our strength, our help. We're all incompetent to live as Christ. But if we're Christ, we have the spirit and he gives life, the life of Jesus that works its way out in our lives. Not perfectly yet, no. But genuinely, in such a way that we can live giving off the fragrance of Christ. Isn't that good? We need to be captivated by Christ's love. Because it is captivating when we really understand it and we take it in. If it doesn't captivate you, ask God for forgiveness that it doesn't. And ask him to make Christ's captivating love more real to you. So that you just love him for what he's done. Understand that if you love Christ and follow him, that's going to split opinion. It really is. But rejoice in the fact that some will be drawn to Christ. Because you can live like Christ. We can. Because he's giving us his spirit. We'll still have to fight sin. We'll still have to put that sin off. We'll still have to seek forgiveness because we'll get it wrong. But we have the spirit. Isn't that good? If we really want to please Christ, Christ isn't going to leave us unable to do it. He gives us his spirit. So we lean on him. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you again for your great love for us. We thank you that you obediently left the glories of heaven, that you lovingly went to the cross, that you sacrificed yourself so that we could be released from our debt of sin, released from the kingdom of darkness, brought into newness of life. We thank you that you poured your spirit into our hearts so that we can live lives that that are following the pattern of your life, so that we can gladly obey our Father in heaven, uh, so that we can be the aroma of you, Lord, to those around us. When people react against that, help us to remember that you have always told us that would be the case. Help us to remember as well, though, that there will be others for whom that is the aroma of life. Lord, we pray that it would be to people in our lives that we know, in our workplace, in our homes, in our streets. Lord, help us to be all that you call us to be. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.